Behavioral, cognitive, and cognitive behavioral approaches are three interrelated theoretical strands that tend to be used in a somewhat integrative way in contemporary counseling practice. However, they actually started out as separate schools of thought. Let's start out by considering a real-world example of behaviorism. I have been conditioned to associate my fridge with yummy food. This association is based on a number of past experiences where I've opened my fridge and been positively reinforced with what I found inside. This conditioned response will persist even when I haven't been to the grocery store in a few weeks and my fridge is mostly full of just condiments. I logically know that there isn't food in the fridge, yet I continue to find myself opening the fridge and blankly staring inside, just in case. This is definitely a conditioned response. When we discuss behavioral approaches, and especially first-generational behavioral approaches or first-wave behavioral approaches, I want you to think of classical and operant conditioning and theorists like Pavlov, Watson, and Skinner. Classical conditioning refers to the work of Pavlov and Watson. As you probably recall, Pavlov paired the sound of a bell with food. Over time, his dogs were conditioned to salivate at the sound of the bell. Watson paired a white fluffy rat with a scary loud noise. Over time, little Albert was conditioned to fear white fluffy animals and objects because he learned to associate them with the loud noise. In general, classical conditioning is going to be closely related to behavioral therapy strategies. So, for example, learning to pair progressive muscle relaxation and breathing techniques with a feared stimulus like getting ready to board an airplane. The idea is that over time you will associate boarding the airplane with relaxation as opposed to fear. Operate conditioning refers to the work of Skinner and the way that people's behaviors can be shaped through reinforcement and to a lesser degree punishment. Reinforcement has to do with anything that is likely to increase a person's behavior. So for example, giving a toddler a favorite treat like a few jelly beans every time that they successfully go to the potty and wash their hands afterwards would be a form of positive reinforcement. This makes it more likely that the toddler will wash their hands after using the bathroom. An example of negative reinforcement could be someone who does the dishes more often to avoid their partner nagging at them. In this case, the behavior doing the dishes is increased because it's reinforced through the avoidance of the negative stimulus, the nagging. So operant conditioning is generally related to behavioral modification strategies rather than to behavior therapy. Platforms like Habitica are examples of ways that people might try to use behavior modification strategies sort of in a mental health context to decrease behaviors like smoking or to increase behaviors like daily exercise. Sometimes when I discuss behavioral strategies with students, they have a pretty negative reaction to the thought of applying purely behavioral principles to their work with clients or with students. And this is probably because conditioning can feel quite sterile and it does lack the depth that is often associated with other forms of counseling or psychotherapy. Um, and in fact, some students have told me that pure behavioral techniques really remind them of strategies that are used to train pets. And that makes sense because on the most basic level, Pavlov, Watson, and Skinner's work was used to demonstrate the way that animals and people learn or can be conditioned through pairing experiences and through reinforcement. On the other hand, behavioral strategies can be particularly useful in combination with cognitive approaches and also with some specific presenting concerns. For example, counselors might use behavior modification strategies with families of children who have been diagnosed with ADHD or autism, and they might use behavior therapy principles in an effort to address certain kinds of phobias. Counselors who describe themselves as aligning with cognitive approaches or with cognitive behavioral approaches are usually referring to, to Aaron Beck's cognitive theory of depression, um, which was originally conceptualized as being separate from these behavioral techniques or strategies that we just talked about. And this theory is really based on the idea that if you can learn to monitor your thoughts, then you can identify cognitive distortions, which lead to less desirable feelings and behaviors. So if I have the thought that this lecture has to be absolutely perfect, or I'm terrible at teaching, which would be a cognitive distortion, then I'm likely to feel anxious and I'm more likely to engage in behaviors like procrastination. The idea being that if I can recognize times where I'm engaging in dysfunctional thinking and I can dispute these thoughts, 
I can replace them with more logical thoughts that will lead to more productive feelings and behaviors. Just as cognitive theory starts out as separate from behaviorism and from behavioral techniques, rational emotive behavioral therapy starts out without the B. It starts out as rational emotive therapy, uh, separate from behaviorism and these behavioral techniques. And then similar to Beck's cognitive approach, uh, behavioral techniques are integrated over time and the approach is renamed REBT, or Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy. One area where students tend to get confused is, is related to the differences between REBT and CBT, and that's because there are many similarities between the approaches in terms of the way that they understand client concerns. Practitioners from both approaches would agree that one's thinking influences one's feelings and behaviors, uh, they would likely also agree that people have a choice over their actions or their behaviors. However, they would probably say that some decisions are made instantaneously and that the thought processes behind these decisions are a lot less conscious. So when we're talking about the ways of understanding, the overarching differences are really found in the terminology. So for example, Beck would refer to cognitive distortions, where Ellis is going to call this stinking thinking. Similarly, Ellis is going to talk about irrational beliefs, and Beck is going to call these core schemas or core beliefs, but they're talking about similar ideas. And over time, Beck and Ellis both embrace uh, behavioral techniques as a part of their approaches and integrate them in as part of their approach. So as a result, they would both likely agree that through practice, repetition, and reinforcement, we can retrain the way that we think and we can critically look at our thought patterns and the way that they lead us to feel and respond to different life circumstances. The most striking differences between CBT and REBT are not in counselor ways of understanding, but are really related to counselor ways of being and their ways of intervening in the counseling relationship. So in REBT, the counselor is going to tend to be more directive they're going to be a little more forceful in the way that they confront things. They definitely tend to use more humor and uh, more self-disclosure uh, in a way to sort of teach. They're taking on kind of a role of teacher. Um, and the counselor is definitely more active in terms of how they're identifying irrational beliefs and disputing them when intervening with a client. By comparison, in CBT, the counselor is still somewhat directive, however, it's a much more collaborative fill generally, and their way of intervening is going to be more consistent with Socratic questioning, which is going to put um, much more of an emphasis on the client discovering distorted thinking for themselves. Over the years, other flavors of cognitive behavioral approaches beyond Beck's analysis have been developed. Some examples include reality therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, multimodal therapy, and mindfulness-based approaches.